Hi and welcome to another chess video. This time around we're going to look at a classical game and this game is from 1981 between Alexander Belyovsky with white and Bent Larsen with black. So we'll start with Bent Larsen. Uh, one of the strongest players probably yeah, in the 60s and 70s he had a fantastic streak where he uh, was winning tournament after tournament and there was a time when you know the Soviets were dominate, dominating chess and the only threats really from the West were uh, Bobby Fischer and Bent Larsen. So he was a top top player uh, around his peak. So this game is perhaps slightly off peak in, in 1981 but he's still uh, uh, I think he was like 46 years old at the time when he was playing against Pelyovsky who was uh, a lot younger than uh, and Larsen and Belyovsky he was uh, and he is a very strong player still keeps a fantastic strength he plays for the Slovenian national team this time around but he has also played for the uh, Soviet national team he was a four-time Soviet champion and an absolute chess legend at his peak I believe he might have been as high as number three I could be wrong but uh, you know Kaspar Karpov he was very close to uh, to those that came behind uh, the two case at the peak of his career and yeah this is from Tilburg in 1981 a tournament won by Alexander Belyovsky and this game featured a Kawakan. Bent Larsen was a very very creative player one that perhaps few people know about but they they should and unfortunately he is uh, on the receiving end of this one but that shouldn't take any, anything away from his fantastic career and um, yeah I should be adding more games by the great Dane on my channel because well he is Danish and Iceland used to be under Danish rule uh, until the 1940s and Bent Larsen also shares my birthday the 4th of March so uh, I always had some you know nice feelings towards Bent Larsen also met him once in when he came to Iceland to uh, be a commentator for a tournament in uh, slightly outside of Reykjavik so I got a chance to uh, to talk to him a little bit uh, you know looking back at it uh, I wish I would have like appreciated more at the time what kind of a legend he was uh, but still I got some nice stories and uh, excellent chess insights but enough of that let's see the game so Alexander Belyovsky had the white pieces and e4 he was a very and is a very strong classical player Preferred e4, I think, for most of his career. And here we have Karakan. Bent Larsen's second favorite opening, he favored the Sicilian defense uh, a bit more over the Karakan, but he did play his fair share of Karakans. So we have knight c3, d takes e4, knight takes, and bishop to f5, which uh, is the main line. But Lassen was also known for playing this line, knight f6, knight takes and g takes. So he was very uh, inventive and original and he liked to uh, create an imbalance like this very early in the game. In this game, however, he uh, went for more well-trodden paths with bishop to f5 and we have the, the main moves here, h4, white tries to attack this bishop, compromise its position on g6, black has to uh, open a square for it with h6, uh, first white plays knight f3, and black has to prevent knight to e5, plays knight d7, and now h5. And now white uh, exchanged his bishops. Uh, the reason is, well, black has wasted some moves here, bishop f5, bishop g6, bishop h7, and then takes to exchange white's bishop that only moved once. Also, the h6 move means that it's very hard to move these pawns, so this pawn's clamp, clamping a little bit down on the king's side, so making it a little bit harder to move. So white doesn't really mind this exchange. Having said that, black is quite solid, and after the normal moves, knight gf6, bishop to f4. Note that bishop d2 is also uh, one of the main moves here, this and bishop to f4. Uh, Lassen played e6 here. Black also likes to play queen a5 here. Kind of forcing bishop d2 and then going back to c7. 
But we have e6 in this game. Pelyovsky castled, bishop to e7. And in, in the coward count, even though black has exchanged the light square bishop, he doesn't mind because it was outside the pawn chain. So instead of being locked with the bishop here, he's quite quite happy to have gotten rid of it. Now white goes uh, with his knight to e5. Uh, the most common move is to play king b1, a typical prophylactic move uh, when you castle queenside, but Pelyovsky went with knight to e5. And uh, we have a5 from Larsen, trying to stake his claim a little bit on the queenside. After having played that, the most likely move is to castle uh, kingside for black. And after rook h uh, to e1, that's exactly what he should have done, to castle kingside. And from there we have a normal position, black is quite solid, just a normal color count. Theoretical uh, or, or topical count of a color count pawn structure with both sides do have their chances, but on this day, Larsen was uh, yeah, feeling adventurous and he went for a4, which was a move that hadn't been tried before or since. And the reason is probably the move that Pelyovsky played here and, well, he wasn't horsing around. And what do you think Pelyovsky played here? A very strong move. So assuming you uh, figure it out, he uh, did play the move, knight g6. Very nice move. So we're attacking the rook, problem number one. Black didn't take, Larson played knight to a d5. But of course we have to check out what happens if black accepts the sacrifice. But it's more of a long term sacrifice. Pelyovsky would have taken on g6, and then we have some forcing moves. We want to take on e6, but of course, try to gang up on the uh, e file. It would be normal for for black to try to, uh, you know, limit the damage of queen to e8, because otherwise knight f5 would uh, both hit this and this. So queen e8 looks kind of forced. Rook uh, d to e1, another forced move to take the queen, and now the bishop is under attack, so we have to move it. Rook e8, I can maybe even take and play bishop d6, so bishop e4, but now c3, getting the bishop off this diagonal, and once that happens, either through bishop to a5, or uh, knight d5 here, bishop d2, eventually the bishop has to move, and after knight f5, uh, the rook is coming in, eventually, we're going to push c4 at some stage, and the rook is coming in, too many weak squares. And, you know, it's, it's like not like an immediate knockdown. Uh, we can count the material. Black has five pawns. White has seven. So not that much of a material disadvantage. But look at the pieces. Uh, white has the fantastic rooks on e-file. Meanwhile, black is having his rooks discoordinated because of the king. And the other pieces don't stand particularly well. The 9 d5 is, is, is fine. But the problem with the king and the, and the uh, yeah, zero coordination of, of the pieces mean that white is just close to winning here. And Larson seemed to realize that, didn't want to enter this line and played knight d5. So he's allowing white to take on h8, which he didn't do, but let's have a look. If you take the rook, I will take on f4. Now black is only down the exchange, and after a move like queen f3, bishop to g5, he's hoping to uh, win this knight, which doesn't have an escape. If you can do that, black would be fine. But Pelyovsky had other ideas. And again, he wasn't horsing around. What did you, do you think he played here? He ignored the uh, attack on the bishop on f4 and played knight to f5. Beautiful knights here. And the fantastic point is if you take on f4, which Lawson didn't do, then we have a fantastic checkmate with knight takes g7 with the knights working beautifully together to uh, to trap the king here. A very nice mate. Perhaps the best move was knight 7 to b6 when the bishop probably retreats. And after something like this, and c4, white has the upper hand uh, by a mile, but 
mm, you know there are still some problems with extracting this knight even though we can uh, even take on e7 here as the computer suggests but perhaps not uh, elementary for a human to to see any of this so knight 7 b6 was probably the toughest defense but Lawson played bishop f8 covering mate on g7 and now bishop d6 not allowing the capture on f4 which would mean that we have to move the knight back and sort of would uh, take some sting out of the attack again uh, we have these uh, mates here if bishop takes d6 we can again take on g7 but i actually prefer knight takes d6 very nice mate again this knight covering now two squares and this knight keeping the checkmate so Lawson got the key uh, the rook finally out of uh, the attack on h8 c4 now kicking the knight which moved to b4 x-ray here covered by the bishop and now queen h3 from here of course eyeing the e6 square and black yeah he's, he simply doesn't have any good moves here he took on g6 but now we uh, see that the queen eyeing e6 is already important rook takes e6 king f7 h takes uh, g6 the rook counts the pawn so the king has to take on e6 but the rookie one is ending the game there's no move here uh, except for knight e5 which Lawson did play but after bishop takes e5 even though d takes e5 is the best move uh, when it's I think made in like 10 or 11 moves but bishop takes e5 is still very strong and actually so strong that black was signed I haven't really checked what the best move is but uh, black is completely lost even though it's half a rook there's no coordination of the forces and the king is simply too weak and for instance if the king tries to run we have knight takes g7 check from this strongly placed queen and mate on the next move so yeah not actually sure what black can do here and clearly neither was bad lesson since uh, he resigned so <laughs> a very nice game by by Belyevsky. Uh, sort of a typical uh, strong russian player that was always in the uh, shadow of Kasparov and Karpov but a very strong player nonetheless that uh, we should know about um, I thank you for watching this video and I hope to see you in the next video which will hopefully be soon see you then bye bye